Okay, looks like we're up and running. So, welcome to Philosophy Roulette number 215. Yo, Bubba Bloop, welcome to the stream where we read and review philosophy papers live. If anyone out there like Bubba Bloop has any suggestions on what you want me to read, please do tell me. Uh, I take requests or even just like topics, but otherwise I guess go see what's new in the world of philosophy publishing. So, just let me know, and uh, if you're here, feel free to ask questions. Continental Philosophy Review. You know, I'd really like to read things in Continental Philosophy Review, but I always find, I think they're just like little, literally review articles. I was like, all right. Or Kent in this. But I'll take a look at content. Cinesemiotics, awesome. Welcome to the stream again. New year, new streams. It'll be fun. So, if you have suggestions on what you want me to read, let me know. Yes, this is a problem with this. These are all reviews. It's, it would be kind of fun if like there were some like review papers that I could like read, but otherwise I'm going to go read like the opposite of continental philosophy in Arkentness, which is usually technical philosophy. And I like technical philosophy, but it's actually not the always the best to read cuz how are you supposed to read formulas on stream? But we're going to take a look at what's coming. So let's see, what has Cinesemiotic sent for me? Is there anything about video game meta? Yes. Oh my god, I had meant to do that. I completely forgot. There's there's papers on live streaming games about the ethics of live streaming games. I meant to do that. Um, I, I'm going to have to go find that Bubba Bloop. Like, I literally had forgotten about it. Um, there are multiple papers, as in, like, I know of two, um, where... Uh, Telephone Country Codes, a shorthand for the history of the world. Yeah, this is not normally what I read. But a fascinating commentary on how to learn. If it's not interesting or formal enough, it's all good. Well, let, let me just take a quick look. And let me write down so I don't forget to go get the uh, stream topic papers. Because there, I had, I knew of at least one to read. Completely forgot about it like the third time. <laughs> You've been digging over the role of Heckler? Feel free to heckle. I've never been able to figure out the logic behind our telephone country code. Follow the humming explains why there is no apparent logic. Their patchwork of reflecting our tumultuous history. Yeah, so this is definitely a history paper. Well, you know. You know what? It's short. I'm going to read it anyway. It's good and quick. So, um. Yeah. Okay. Might as well. A water showed moment 28 years ago this week. I've arrived in Sweden for a three months' stay working as a cleaner on the dockyards in Gothenburg. After a week, I managed to get enough kroner in a public phone box to call my family and let them know I'd arrived safely. That is so depressing, like, that you didn't have enough money to tell people you arrived in a foreign country alive. But yeah. Don't feel sorry, it's cool. I spoke to them for about 20 seconds before my exchange ran out. Wow. As a challenge of international direct dialing, the ability to make country code country-to-country -country phone calls without the help of a human operator, it was around this point that I started to make a mental note of the country codes I'd places of visit I'd visited. From Sweden, I knew I needed to dial 44 to get back to the UK. Doing the reverse, calling Sweden from the UK, I needed 46 instead. At, excuse me. At the time, I remember thinking that the allocation of these numbers was probably based on the alphabet. 44 was close to 46, and U of the United Kingdom was close to the S of Sweden. Who needed Wikipedia back then? Yeah, you actually had to be smart and know things. And it's the, all the technology is terrible, and no one has to think anymore. That's actually an old platonic complaint about the new tech of the day, which was books. Plato disliked books because he thought it made people lazy. Um, gnarly, what's up? Welcome to stream. We're reading a quick little short article about telephone country codes, and then we'll get to some uh, more philosophy. But this is just a little bit of warm-up fun. In fact, the development of the country code system was not nearly that simple, telling it as it does by proxy story of global geopolitical change since the early 1960s. Yeah, and you can suggest things if you want me to read if you have, like, a topic or something. Yep, yep. An initial list of largely European country codes was mooted in 1960 by the organization which was to become the ITU, International Telecommunication Union, the UN agency which helps coordinate global telecoms. The list was published as the Red Book and proposed around 50 two-digit codes presumably used at the time by operators rather than subscribers, including the now defunct Yugoslavia 63, Arabia 26, and Czechoslovakia 57. 
The Red Book became blue in 1964 and brought with it a proposal for a new system. The world was divided into nine zones, and countries were given one, two, or three digit country codes, with the initial digit representing the zone. World Zone 1 was North America, Zone 2 was Africa, Europe bagged both 3 and 4 because of the sheer number of larger countries, and so on. Yeah, this is one of those things. The way the world is set up is just always one of these historical hodgepodges. The idea that we actually planned ahead and like did something in some formal way is just that's never happened in the history of the world, at least on the global scale. We're not that organized. Look at the vaccine rollout. In, the, in 1968, the book, of, the book was white and built on the new model with a wide range of changes and additions, including East Germany, 37, the Trucian States, 971, and Zanzibar, Turkey, Zanzibar's 252, I don't have to read these numbers, Turkey, which was in 1964, had the European Code 36, moved to Zone 9, Western Asia, and the Middle East, and adopted its current country code 90. Yeah, and this is one of those uh, political moves here. Sinus Semiotics wants one of this one. All right. I'll copy the link. We'll take a look in a sec. We couldn't have planned it out how the internet would turn out. Look at it now. Exactly. This is exactly what happens. Um, everyone thinks there uh, were like things get uh, done. We'll see if this is available. The philosophy of mathematics introductory. Okay. Um, let's see. Is this available? Oh, it's a chapter in a book. Let's see. Do we got this? Oh, um, no. Nah. Sorry, man. I can't read a book. I don't have the paper. But we can talk about philosophy and math in a minute. Okay, so this is almost done, actually. It's a short paper. You, you have to tell me about those numbers. It's curious. Okay. But, I mean, this is the sort of thing that gets, gets political. Turkey got booted out of uh, Europe, and uh, now, it's, now there's still fights over the European Union. In 1972, was green and did a lot of tidying up Central Central... Sent several Central American countries like El Salvador and Honduras left the North American Zone 1 and became part of Zone 5, South America. The Trucian states merged and became the United Arab Emirates and acquired Code 971, and Rhodesia became Zimbabwe, Ceylon became the same country code but became Sri Lanka. Meanwhile, Morocco strangely found itself with three country codes all to itself. Morocco special. Oh, the prime numbers, cutesy. The books in the next few years started with orange and yellow, but their four-year cycles were eventually abandoned so that the ITU could keep pace with the demands of the new world of personal computing. The changes then read like a shorthand of the history of the world. Yeah. In 1984, the Republic of Alper Volta became Burkina Faso, and the Falkland Islands, previously assigned to Guatemala, acquired their own country code, their own code 500. The same year, a new code 850 was created for North Korea and South Korea, retaining code 82. After German reunification in 1990, East Germany's Code 37 was deleted in favor of West Germany's 49. See, they could have just kept it. They didn't need to bother. Eritrea seceded from Ethiopia, 251 and 93, and acquired a new Code 291. Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, and several other states split from Zone 7, originally named USSR, USSR in 1964 and 1993, the only former Soviet Republic that retained its seven designated and remains Kazakhstan. Very nice. Yugoslavia was deleted in 1993 and became Serbia and Montenegro, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, and Macedonia. Vatican City gained its own code 379 in 1995 instead of just being reachable through Italy. And you see, this is definitely a po political like power play. We're, we need our own phone number, even though they're just in Italy. In 97, Czechoslovakia became the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Following its independence from Indonesia, East Timor was assigned code 670 in 1999. Palestine was given code 970 in 1999, replacing its previous axis via Israel on code 972. And if that's not political, I don't know what is. In fact, the original 1960 Red Book list only... Six countries today retain the codes that they were initially given. Coincidentally, rather fittingly, and for my following the humming story, two of these are ever lovely Sweden and my own UK. Yeah, this is a history of uh, the European like uh, state of the world. Yeah, so they happen to have a lot of prime numbers, you're saying, Santa Semiotics? That's a little funky, but I guess it has to do with the way they uh, broke everything down. Which is kind of interesting. Yeah, they might have used a bunch of odd numbers and like threes and sevens and nines. Yeah. So that's kind of fun. Yeah, that's fun. I mean, yeah, a little bit of fun. Like how the technology we have 
like everything gets reflected in like these sort of like weird little uh, numbers and codes that um, you know just part of our everyday lives. Like, why do you dial forty four to dial the UK? Why do you dial number one if you're dialing the United States? It's the way it is. Okay, so if you guys have other uh, suggestions of actual papers, I can't read a textbook at the moment because, like, yeah. <laughs> Like, if you had a chapter that you wanted me to take a look at, be happy to uh, look at, like, a chapter, but um, textbook's a little hard to read on stream, so. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, so moving on, but feel free to make other suggestions, ask questions. Let me know. Um, Karma's argument from us. What do we got here? Uh, let's just open with Firefox real quick. See what this says. Mathematics and religion. S similar solitudes. Where is this from? Is this just some guy? All right, so we got Professor. All right, so we got a two-page paper. Um. Okay, we can read this. Do you have any other mathematics as religion? Okay, there, Plato. Um, actually, not Plato. It's um. Pythagoras. Pythagoras is the uh, original mathematical cult leader. He was a cultist, and you know, the Pythagorean theorem, I mean, he didn't actually come up with it, it was already known. But, like, yeah, I, I don't know. Because, you know, people send me stuff. I, that's why I like the uh, this site. It All these people are, these are all professional authors. So I, I know I'm not reading um, <laughs> some crackpot. I mean, I've read some crap before. I and even this site is not like not everything's professional, and so you know, hey, Demarshall, what's up? So it could just be some crackpot, but yeah, Leo Junker, I don't know off the top of my head. Let me ask you this: What question or paradox for, first took you on philosophy? A uh, Hume's problem. It was a uh, Hume's problem, um, in that we didn't really understand. Uh, induction or what it actually meant to uh say the world is a some way could it just be causally was it causally um important or was it just some correlation so it was hume hey doing the marshall yeah um it wasn't it wasn't so much causation but understanding why um when we say the world is the way the world we when we say the world is a certain way is it actually that way or are we just making stuff up so it's um the causal and it comes down to causal structure of like our statements do they actually are they causally uh, related to the world or are we just full of hooey okay cool thanks for stopping by bubble bloop i appreciate the lurk so we're going to read this short article, Mathematics and Religion, uh, Similar Solitudes by Leo Junker. Um, no. Why is this weird? It's not, like, super, um... I wouldn't say uh, induction is super, uh, controversial. I mean, different depending on uh, what your take on it, it could be, of course, but, oopsie. So, I mean, there there's some co complexity of, of course, there's a massive amount of literature regarding induction and how we can actually make statements about one part of the world and say that it generalizes to the rest of the universe or even anything else and so there's mathematical induction there's scientific induction there's like inductive reasoning and so it gets a uh, very big very fast let me uh download this real quick and open this up with a uh, proper um pdf viewer where i can make markings and whatnot okay there we go. So now you guys can at least see a little bit better. So, yeah, I mean, the, I, there's not like, I don't have like one take on induction. So, yeah, that's just how it is. It's it's too big just for me to be like, give you a, a hot take on it. It's like, yeah, induction's cool. But yeah, if like you had like a, 
I've read paper. I read a paper on human human induction a while back. It was a good paper, but it's just like one little topic in it. So, yeah, there's just too much to say. All right, so let's read this paper, the short paper: Mathematics and Religion, Similar Solitudes. Leo Junker. It consists of nothing but rules and doctrines, and is totally irrelevant to my life. For many people, this would be their experience of organized religion. However, it is also how many would characterize mathematics. I guess this would be formal mathematics. Everyone has to know how their bank account works. So that is completely relevant to most people in the United States and most of the world. The language might be a little different in the case of mathematics, more like nothing but arbitrary rules and procedures, but the perceptions are similar. So, okay. This is sort of a functional take. Like, what does this, like, organized religion have to do with me? And what does, like, um, like academic mathematics have to do with me? So, this is already sort of um, an int- uh, the, way it, the way it functions in your life is where this is starting off. In my extensive contact with undergraduate students. Hey, guys, and feel free to ask questions. I don't know what this is, but we're going to find out. In my extensive contact with undergraduate students intending to be elementary school teachers, I find three types of reactions to their past experience of mathematics, two of which lead to a misreading of the subject. Many dislike and fear mathematics because they feel that at some point in their study, they were unable to understand the reasons behind the rules imposed on them by their teachers and were not helpful, not given helpful answers when they asked for them. These students deserve credit for not consenting to answers that they do not connect to their prior understanding. Another group of incoming students profess to enjoy mathematics, but not proofs. These students view mathematics as a set of procedures that, when practiced accurately, leads to answers that are clear. I like mathematics because the solutions are either right or wrong. There is no gray area. Both of these views correspond to similar reactions to a religious upbringing. Some reject it because they feel they were asked to assent to doctrines that made no sense. They were not rooted in their experience. The others welcomed rules because they liked to live their lives, their lives to be ordered by a clear demarcation between black and white. Okay, so this is again the functional uh, similarity. How do people rea- uh, react to uh, rule-based systems, basically? Um, some don't like rules because they don't know what the rules are about, and others like rules because they don't because they like structure, basically. And it's funny. Um, I have a friend with a four-year-old, and they apparently like the four-year-old has like. Do they have actual correlation data on these statements? I have no idea. This is this person's uh, personal opinion. It says their extensive contact with undergraduate students. So I mean, I suppose this person is just an academic. Um, who teaches, and I, I think it's at Queens College or something. So this person being part of the uh, City University of New York, ha- I mean, assuming they have actually worked at the City University of New York, they have had extensive contact with undergraduate students. That's The CUNY system ha- puts through so many students in here in New York City. But do they have um, numbers? Obviously not. There's no references on this stuff. But yeah, again, this is like the functional understanding of these things and how people like, and I was just giving the anecdote of my friend's four-year-old who has like uh, cheat days, basically. Um, Lapatel says, that sounds like BS with no intention to show the accuracy of a statement, but to push a narrative that fits their interpretation. Absolutely. This is philosophy. We're going to see what, we're going to see where they get with this though. We don't know if they're going to do something stupid or do something clever yet. Because sometimes they, um, yeah, as as Sinus Semisiak says, this is, is is a narrative account, not a science paper. So we don't know where they're going, and so we can't uh, don't jump to, to conclusions yet that what they say is um, bullshit. Because it might be bullshit, or it might just be like you know someone reflecting on their long career, and it might be a nice story about that, and that's okay. But we have to get there first. <laughs> the yeah, the four year old had like what it sounded like cheat days like they could they only had like dessert on certain days of the week and it wasn't that day so they couldn't have ice cream and I was like wow you've really traded your kid and she was like no the kid wanted to have to understand when I they could have cake and it turned out the kid really liked structure and so they're like oh well we have cake on Sundays and so the kid's like okay that Sunday is cake day so that's like the one day of the week and I just, it was just really funny that like this like four-year-old was just like that's when we have dessert no other day <laughs> so some people like it I mean you don't have to be four to like structure you don't have to be older either okay so granted 
This is a rather strong statement right here. Both of these views correspond to similar reactions to a religious upbringing. This is getting more into opinion that how much, even though this person may have had lots of contact with undergraduate students with regarding um, mathematical education, how many religious uh, questions has this person really uh, like surveyed across people? Is this person also a professor of religion? Maybe not, but I mean, let's give them a uh, benefit of the doubt at the moment. Like I said, we don't know if uh, where this is going. Okay, when not rooting experience, others welcome rules because they like their lives to be ordered by clear demarcation between black and white. Yeah, corresponds. Okay, in a thought experiment, it is very helpful. We don't have data on most of what we do in philosophy, so to look at, suppose we have a set of people S, then we compare it to another set T. Yeah, you know, that you're allowed to set up your thought experiments as you want. That's right, you're allowed to talk about stories. So, okie dokie. But these are not only not the only ways to experience mathematics or religion. You see, it was a bait and switch. See, lab potato? person's not crazy bait and switch they got you all worked up and then they said but hold on a sec this is not the only way to talk about this this is what people do <laughs> they they get you worked up and then they say but like let's pull it back a little bit so you can see how this is uh, already designed they get you talking about it in one way here at the top like we're going to talk about the functional functional way that people deal with these things they functionally react in a certain way and then they say okay but let's hold on with this like sort of hard uh, this sort of like one, one, uh, one perspective, <laughs> but these are not the only ways to experience mathematics or religion for mathematics and religion. Both the truest profession is profession that is grounded in positive experience and embodied in common committed practice. Okay. So again, now we're getting into a habit here, like a talk of like committed practices, some sort of habit theory. What do we do habitually? All right. Fortunately, for a certain percentage of university students, their high school mathematics experience has been one in which their understanding of mathematics flourished and grew deep roots. Lab potato. I mean, a population is always a distribution of personality traits, environment, and other things. Like, it is not hard to find samples to fit a narrative. You can pick out a psychopath and assume his or her traits are indicative of human nature, so you need actual data to indicate that there is a trend before even taking account about the explanation that might account for the observation yes but again we're not we might not be doing that here we don't know where this person is going so we have to see what they're saying first um yeah we have to see what they're doing with this because if there is no like hard uh, conclusion about this uh, like in terms of personality traits or something like that then maybe th what this person is legitimately is we just don't know yet. Like, uh, you have to hold off judgment before getting angry. Uh, that saying this person is doing something illegitimate. We just don't know. I and mean, a lot of philosophy goes this way. You think they're going to make some of the you know, bad philosophy. They say s stuff and then you're right. Um, lab. But, like, some of the better philosophies, you know, they say some stuff and you say, hey, look, this was just a preparatory sort of story to let you get an idea of what they're thinking. And then the actual conclusion isn't as, uh, it, it isn't as ungrounded. I'm trained in STEM and believe in God, statistical method and sampling instead of proposing a seven hour and try to fit things into it. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody holds the judgment when I'm angry. Yeah, no, that's fine. Like, don't worry about like um, your training. But what we're doing here is we have to get you have to give the you have to give the uh, person a little bit of charity here. Like, you don't know where they're going, and sometimes these people they're. Let me tell you something about philosophers. These people who write this philosophy stuff, they're very clever. Some of these people are really clever. They know what they're doing when they write the paper. And when they write the paper to make you angry, it might be because it's on purpose. And so you have to not get, you don't let them do this to you. They know what they're doing. Don't let them do it to you. You have to be a little careful around them. Because this might be, uh, like I said, I think this is a setup at the moment. I really do. And uh, yeah, play nice in a semiotics. 
for killing for a certain percentage of university students in their high school. Their, their high school mathematics experience has been one in which their understanding of mathematics flourished and grew deep roots. Perhaps it happened because they consistently had good teachers who understood students' difficulties, who knew ways to connect theory to practice, and who gave time for those connections to grow. Yes, they fillet the skeptic at the end if they're good. <laughs> yes, they do. These are the students whose teachers did not shut down opportunities to explore mathematical structure by imposing rules that made no sense to the student or perhaps even to the teacher. For other students, the connections and patterns of mathematics appealed to them so strongly and absorbed them so completely that from an early age they were able to build on their understanding even with a poor teacher. For these students, theorems have content and formulas have a history. For them, the rules and formulas, the theorems and procedures, do not look like the hard outer surface of a frightful machine, but rather like the outward appearance of or the skin of a pulsating organism. These students know what it is to participate in the life of the subject. Lab potato, kappa, clever enough to not push anything forward until an actual scientist comes along and gives an actual explanation with details, data, and well-supported explanation. Sorry, philosophers, we are failed lawyers at best. I don't know, you see what happened right here? When they finally got to making a claim about people, in came the reference. <laughs> yeah, we've got uh, differing perspectives on philosophers at the moment. Um, so as soon as this person did make any claim about how people view their work, then we had a reference. So this is, they had a little bit of a setup story, and then finally when they needed, to, when they made a stronger claim, then the reference came in. So this is, this person knows what they're doing, um, as far as writing goes. These students know what it is to participate in the life of the subject. <coughs> This approach is found especially in the mathematical community that produces journal papers and mathematics textbooks to codify and organize their mathematical discoveries. They write the skin, but they know the life it holds. Even a seasoned research mathematician, when reading an important paper for the first time, will be reading it to find out what is really going on here, looking for the meaning beneath the surface. Whether the skin repels non-mathematicians entirely depends on the extent to which the stewards of the discipline are sensitive to the way many people react to it and whether they understand the origins of those reactions. I mean, you just have to admire this person's writing skill at the moment because this is a very short paper and you have to understand why are they writing it. This sort of these sort of sentences going on here, like who's writing this? You're talking about skin like, you've got this metaphor working. Stewards of the discipline. You've got multiple metaphors. You've got the skin of a mathematical theory. You've got the stewards of, di of a discipline. And so this is a... You're getting a little bit more sophisticated with the rhetoric all of a sudden. Sydney semiotic. Scientists don't just read the problem. The data is collected with a focus on an imaginary hypothesis. It's always a storytelling game that intends to produce explanations, not data. The data that is not useful until it's explained, which this, which requires this mode of thought. Yeah, you can get into the philosophy of science about this and what the and how theories only are embedded in society and things like that. And so, even in science, you have um, overarching narratives. You've got bigger theories that the small theories you're working on definitely need to do it. And you can't just say, ah, uh, yeah, as you say, you can't just look at the database or just some numbers and say, aha, the data says the problem is this. You have to understand the bigger picture. And that is always the case. There is no, um, there's nothing just uh, off on its own on like an island. Okay. So, he, okay, now we're going to pivot again. Religion, too, can present a formal and sometimes cold and incomprehensible surface to the world. Again, with the surface metaphors, the skin and the surface. As in mathematics, however, this belies the fact that under this surface many participate in genuine and meaningful religious activity. Those who have not been exposed to religion as experience, who have, who have been shown only codifications whose ex excuse me, codifications whose existential meaning has been lost along the way, or who have not thought it worth their while to take the time to look more closely, will see only a desiccated carapace, a shell in which there is no life. For religion, as for mathematics, codification is necessary as a way to communicate shared experience and to test the validity of that experience through formal expression. But, as in mathematics, this expression should not be allowed to become impervious to insight, and it should never be imagined that in mathematics or in, in religion, formal expression is all there is. This is what I've heard from, I'm not 
particularly religious myself, but this is what I've heard from other people that are, it's that, of course, there's all these rules and regulations, but those are always after the fact. That's, that's missing the point. And I mean, I'm not a formal mathematician either. I mean, I do logic sometimes, and there's always, like, you can learn the rules of logic, but you don't understand what's going on just by learning the rules. But you have to understand the rules to then figure out what also is, what also is usually uh, going on. So you need the rules in order to communicate, but that's like the least of it. That's like the uh, baseline. You have to understand sort of like the baseline things to just get your foot in the door. And then you might be able to understand what's going on later. But yeah, this is what people who are religious have, you know, so, somewhat described to me. It, it, you have to be in the sort of the world, and then you understand it better. Uh, I kind of understand that. All right, so continuing. And yeah, keep asking questions if you want. Please do it, shall we? Under the skin, both are areas of human activity that involve joys and disappointments, pride and humility, mistakes and successes, friendships and friction. The activities differ in the range of their foci. Mathematics explores the ubiquitous and ever-varying manifestations of numeric and geometric structure and plays with the mind's ability to construct consistent edifices of ever-higher abstract forms. Religion explores the scope and limits of human life, its beginning and its end, the meaning that holds these together, and the relationship to others, the encounter with God. For mathematics, activity as much for religious activity at heart is not the codification that matters most, it is not what drives us, not what attracts and keeps us engaged from day to day. Okay, so this is really just the reflection of the author on both of these practices. I mean, sure. I have nothing, like, much to say here, but it's just, um, it's, like, cool. I mean, since I don't do either of these particularly, um, I will just have to take the author's word for all of these things, because I don't deal with, um, numeric or geometric structures. I just don't, nor do I practice organized religion particularly, so, okay. What matters most in the end is that we are particular human beings. Oh, yeah, this is what the other thing I want to say. Human activity. These are human activities. Um, so, yeah. And so, as a human activity, it has all the richness of human life because lots of people do this stuff. And you have to take all those people somewhat seriously. There are very serious religious people and there are very serious mathematicians. And so, it's like, especially if you're a scientist, you have to take the, what the math people say very seriously. So that's fair. So, and you may not agree with how they go about doing their mathematics, but you have to take them seriously because they are serious people, like some of the mathematicians at least. Okay, continuing. What matters most in the end is that we are particular human beings who interact for time with other particular human beings and with particular objects in the world around us. We speak to them and they join in conversation. We push against them and they push back, and in this back and forth, we discern the contours of what is true, not just by personal or social construction, but by encounter. This encounter is the area for after-the-fact recognition of what is fitting and therefore beautiful. Okay, yeah, so this is going, see, you, as I was saying before, this was a functional theory that they start off with, and now they're going, the conclusion is a pragmatic uh philosophy right here dewey is a pragmatist and this is exactly the sort of uh sort of thing a pragmatist would say is that in the process and action of living this sort of thing then you figure out what is the truth and like in the doing you find out what is the case not by the theory but in the doing of it of the practice this is where we meet surprise and delight this is where beauty resides beauty inhabits the distance between people and between people and between subject and object, it is the true nature of that dis distance, never bridged by closure or conceptual reduction, always an invitation for new delight. This is where, in mathematics and in religion, our activity is ultimately spiritual and where all we encounter is creation. Okay, very nice. So yeah, professor of mathematics at Queen's University. So I mean, that could be Queen's, oh, it's Queen's University, Canada, not Queen's, uh, <laughs> New York City. Okay, either way, it's a. am pretty sure that's a major university. It's like a good place. The person probably does know what a lot of student interaction is like. Um, cool. All right, so fun little paper. Again, there's nothing much like super complicated going here. This is mostly a, re a reflection on, as the title laid out, this person sort of 
how where this person finds meaning in the work that they do. And so I have no idea if Lab Potato left. I mean, I mean you can like click on the uh, users in chat. And so I don't see no Lab Potato there. So I pick next. Yeah. All right. I'm going to try and find a short one. Um, yeah, again, I do take Infernical Parsim or the McMarin Row file. Policy. What's inferential? Oh, inferential problems. Yeah, how's like What's it? Inferential, inferential problems. Um, let's see. Save window. Back to the other window. Okay. Yeah. So if you guys have more suggestions, um, let's uh. All right, that's not it. All right. So maybe I'll pull that later. More of the philosophy of math. Law can't spell. Yeah, it happens. Don't need telephone country. Okay, so now we need a really short paper because I've already been going for half an hour. But that's okay. So this is 215. Um, can you pick an easy one so I can follow along? I picked them randomly, unfortunately. I can't guarantee it's easy. Um, we'll see. I'll, I'll try. Sometimes they sound easy and they are not. Um, you know what? I've seen these papers maybe they just have the uh in defense of donald and proper names let's see so this is 15 pages that'd be just painful at the moment free will and design desire this is 13 pages i make a case for the thesis that no one can refrain from trying to attain his or well, this might be at least. Let's see if it's available. It's, it seems, um, you want grounding, bottom one, grounding pluralism, or metaphysics of grounding. You like the grounding. All right, let's take a look at that, too. Why do you think grounding is easy? Well, you're in luck. It's here. Um, it's 24 pages. That would take another two hours. Um, yeah, that's the problem with this. Uh, let me show you what uh, how many pages this is. This is 29 pages. Okay, it's mostly kind of double spaced, not quite double spaced, but <laughs> grinding. Yeah, the problem is it's very long, and I would be going for a very long time. Um, like I'd be going for like this will take two hours is the issue. Um. So, we can try it. Hold, let's hold on one sec, okay? Let's just, um... Uh, let's see if we can find you another grind, gr uh, grounding paper, not a grinding paper. This free will and desire... Well, it's not available. Okay, so we can't do that. Anything metaphysics... Okay, so we've got a request for metaphysics. That's fine. Let, we can find some more stuff. See, look, grounding pluralism, more grounding. Oh, um... Okay, we've got a ton of grounding uh, metaphysics here. Let's see. Realist waiting for Godot. Relativism and conservatism. Uh, let's see if we can find. All right, let's see if we can find some metaphysics. Or what we can do is, of course, go to the metaphysics category. Against Gru Mysteries. Um. Do you want to see some Gru mysteries? I don't know if you know what that is, but like, um, this mental surgery, what's that? Uh, you, you, yeah, see, you're picking these, uh, ones on the names. I'm picking them on length. You're picking them on the names. John Campbell has claimed that the interventionist account of causation must be amended if it's to be applied to causation in psychology. The problem, he argues, is that it follows from the so-called surgical constraint. All right, let's see if it's available. Because if it's not here, I can't read it for you anyway. You love metaphysics taking, same as taking acid. Good to know. Very short one. You and your philosophy of math all of a sudden. What is going on? Let's see. I keep hitting. Okay. All right. This is 17 pages of single space. This is basically. Oh, shortest paper ever published in an academic journal. Very funny. 
A direct search of the CDC 660 yields this number as the smallest instance for which four-fifth four power sum to a fifth power. This is a counterexample to a conjecture by Euler that is at least n nth power required to the sum of an n power less greater than two. That is amazing. Um, 1966 or something. Good for that person. Shortest paper. Oh, okay. Shortest philosophy paper. Hey, Aristotle, what's up? Yeah, I'm just trying to um, find something that isn't going to be like two hours going. Wait, did they just... Un, an, un, the unsuccessful treatment of a case of writer's block. Veterans Hospital Administration. So, it's an empty space is what it is. Well, I'm, I, I suppose... <laughs> Dennis Upper is very proud to have his name in print. Journal of Applied Behavioral Analysis. <laughs> very cute. That is that is actually kind of amazing, though. Okay, these cute ones. All right, so I'm gnarly. I don't know if you can, you're can you spotting it, but let me show you something. I have a little search thing, and it highlights all the short papers. So that way I don't have to, like read two hour long papers because that would kill me see like the preface shows up and i've got like question marks so give me one sec and i'll find you a uh self-intimation infallibility and higher order evidence i read that one though the real issue with recalcitrant emotions reply to grant grankowski um what's grew grew is a very interesting thing actually i like that grew grew Anything new in analysis? You know, I should check analysis. Gru is a color. It's green up until uh, January 1st, 2030. And after that, it's blue. And it's a problem with induction. We should actually do like stuff about this. Um, so, um, it's not available. It was just I wanted to see what it was because it was short. Yeah, it's not available. But that's what it is. It's a color that is green up until a certain date and then blue afterwards and what happens is how do you explain that emeralds are green and not grew because all the emeralds you have seen up until this point have been green but they could also be grew and they could all may turn blue on january 1st 2030 so that's what grew is and it's a problem with induction so let's what we're going to go do real fast is we're going to go to the because we had a request for um metaphysics metaphysics and let's see is there anything here is this just the wow this is just all the do you have a particular um topic in metaphysics you want to see um gnarly because uh there are a lot of uh, metaphysical papers. Um, causation, varieties of causation, chance, and... Oh, God. Global metaphysical theories. We'll just click on this. Unless you want to walk, read something on grounding. You um, can always look for grounding, too. Order... Uh, pub year... Is this the right way to do it? I'm trying to remember. Uh, nuts is the wrong direction. Because what I can do is search in what's recently been published in uh, this topic. But this has no page number. Oh, these are all manuscripts, which is annoying. It doesn't say anything. Alright, you know what we'll do? Let's go check analysis real fast. And that way, they have they tend to have a lot of metaphysics too. Yeah, like proto phenomenal pop properties. Wouldn't that be fun? Could go look at that. Um, let's see what's fourth come. Steganography? No, 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 no. Shifty evidence and shifty books. I think I've read some of this stuff. Let's go see what this uh, Russellian physicalism, because this is metaphysics, and proto phenomenal philosophies. See, Russellian monism. This is definitely metaphysics. Is it available, though? No. Come on, people. I hate you all. Why can't you just publish your papers on the website? It'd be so nice. 
Uh, I read this one. Let's see, this is a problem. I read a lot of these. Um, a new cosmological argument from grounding. Let's go. Okay, let me go back to forthcoming. See if there's anything new here. Shifty and shifty books. The modal argument improved. Grounding grounds necessity. I have a yes. I have an email address. You can send me stuff at. I don't like putting my name in here. You know, I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, whisper you. Why you no clicky? Oh, I can get myself articles from analysis too. This is me just being uh, pissy. Of course I can get articles. I know how uh, the uh, internet works. I mean, this is my, um, this is the page. I refused you on your uh, steganography. This, you can see right here, um, like, on my, um empty tab page what this third link might be right here <laughs> I, I just like showing off that we can't actually read papers in philosophy it's one of my little uh damn the man moments oh the I I didn't well first of all all of you should know if you scroll down you will find all my contact in email I don't like putting my contact email in um the chat box yeah like that site yes like I've told like all my contact info is just below in the info so that's you can always send me stuff down there. I didn't refuse you, semiotics. <laughs> I just don't put it in the chat box. You can just send me. It's like it's just below. There's contact info like right there. Like there's like nothing hidden about me in this a whole like thing I'm doing here. Ooh, what might be? There's a link to a site with my full name as the website. My entire name. It's myname.com. Uh, and I will, okay, so I will start sending you my contact info here. Oh, it's on the iPhone app? Okay, fine. Um, yes, I will send you, like, if you want my, my, like, email link, it's fine. But, like, that's why I just use the, um, what's it called? The whisper function here, because it's a... The DM works just fine, and I check this almost daily, so it's really not a problem. Okay, so here we go. We got a nice paper by Stephen Finley and Benjamin Lennertz. Yes, only semi-fascist. Of course, that sounds great. I'd love to be semi-fascist. So, this is philosophy of language, and, uh, ooh, okay, epistemic modals. Oh, dear. Let me double check that this is not like a terrible paper. Because if it's like all logic, I can't read it either. Uh, okay, this is not terrible. Well, it might be terrible, but it's not all uh, mathematical formulas. So. He has 16 publications and he hasn't even graduated with a PhD yet. Okay, so this is the link to this page. You can get the um, paper right here. Well, which one of these authors? The one I am or the one you had? 16 publications, not even a PhD yet. Yeah, there's a few of those out there. But I'm sure they're all crap publications. Okay, on a different paper. And uh, you can always recover the link by taping exclamation point paper but yeah all right so now we can actually do a proper paper um now not a proper paper oh is this not even highlightable interesting all right so cool so onward and remember you can ask questions let me know hey 
Aristotle, I'm published and I don't have a PhD either. <laughs> Introduction. The characterization of modal concept as quantifiers over possibilities, what we'll call the quantifier analysis, claims that what is possible is what is true in some possibilities and what is necessary and what is true in all possibilities. <laughs> yeah, but I'm nuts. Okay, so this is the metaphysics of possibilities, what we're talking about in this paper. What is What do we understand when we say something is possible? And the quantifier analysis is saying, look, it's a range of things is what's possible. When we're talking about something, it's a range of things that could happen. That's what we mean by could happen is that there's a set of things and any one of them might happen. Okay, much of QA's influence is due to its application to the semantics of modal terms in natural language like mut, must, might, and may. Excuse me. By positing contextually variable parameters that define the relevant domain of possibilities, QA provides a flexible and unifying framework that accommodates the modal terms have different senses or flavors, including epistemic, deontic, metaphysical, and teleological. And this is why this is a good paper, since you guys wanted some metaphysics. We're talking about the metaphysics of possibility. What does it mean to be possible? And so, like, if you want to talk about grounding, what is possibly grounding, you can talk about the range of things that can be grounded. This paper addresses a problem arising from some epistemic uses of cert of some epistemic uses of modals. Certain might sentences appear felicitous, although according to QA, they are necessarily false. Some philosophers, Humer, Braun, and DeRose, have appealed to this problem in rejecting QA, but otherwise it has received little attention. Greater attention has been paid to a relative question in formal epistemology. How to square square Bayesian probabilist normative theory, which says that we should be completely confident of a logical and mathematical truths with, with seemingly rational uncertainty about su such things. So basically, what is this? How do we understand that a logical truth has to be necessarily true, but you know, everything else in our life is not necessarily true? And so how are we com so confident about logical or mathematical truths when everything else is uncertain? So what's the difference there? Like some answers to that question, our solution recognizes how actual reasoning is simpler than the ideal. However, our question is descriptive about what are we saying with might. We offer a pragmatic explanation of why making these claims makes sense despite their being false, as QA maintains. Okay, so these people are towing the party line here, saying that when you say something might, you're talking about a range of possibilities, a range of instances that might all, that could happen. All right, so, but then they're going to make some sort of pragmatic claim about certain ones and why it sounds okay, even though it's still false. Firestorm. <laughs> Firestorm, thank you for the raid. I'm reading some metaphysics of possibility here. Um, awesome. Thank you, Firestorm. That's awesome. How are you? I hope you're uh, having a good stream. Caboozled, how are you, Amrez? Yeah, welcome. I'm reading a paper on the metaphysics of uh, possibility here. Um, so, I hope you were guys were having more fun playing Tetris or something. <laughs> What's up, Firestorm? Thanks for the raid. I appreciate it. Okay. Neve and Luke wonder... Yeah, and ask questions along the way. I'm just reading this for the first time. It's a little bit of fun for me. Neve and Luke wonder whether various numbers are prime. How about 899... Neve asks, thanks Aristotle, appreciate that. Well, it's not divisible by 2, 3, 5, or 11, Luke replies. Neve says, 899 might be prime. In fact, 899 is a product of 29 and 31, and not prime. Nonetheless, Neve's assertion that 899 might be prime seems natural and appropriate. It is natural to think that given what Neve and Luke knew at the time, it might have been prime. According to the standard interpretation, it is this qualified epistemic modal that Neve asserted. Okay, so like if you have are lacking information, there might be a possibility in the range of uh, the way the world might be that a number is prime because you only have a certain amount of information about it and it's not ruled out. So that's kind of what's going on here. However, if QA is correct, there is a problem. QA holds at 899. Oh no, your internet died. That's annoying. Uh, you know, I've been noticing. You know, 
I think Twitch is being a little funky in the last few days too. I've noticed a lot of people had some problems um, in the last week. So maybe Twitch is uh, also their servers aren't doing the best. I mean, I hope they get fixed. However, if QA is correct, there is a problem. QA holds that 899 might be prime uttered in Neve's context. It's true just in case there is a possibility possibility compatible with what she and Luke know in which 899 is prime but it is necessarily false that 899 is prime so there are no such possibilities therefore QA tells us that what Neve says is false you know what's interesting about this is that you say look 899 is necessarily the multiplication uh, of 29 and 31 you don't have to listen to normal mathematics. You can have funky mathematics, even though that's not what they were saying. It is not necessarily false. It's necessarily false in classical mathematics. You could have non-classical mathematics. And in that case, 899 could be prime in that other sort of thing. Or prime not might not be the same thing. So there are like really funky philosophical ways around it. But like this is not the only way out of this problem. There are other ways. They're just a bit more radical. Okay. One might welcome this result. It explains why observers like us can react to this conversation by saying Neve is wrong. 899 is necessarily not prime. If asked whether we agree with Neve that 899 might be prime, it is natural to say we do not. Perhaps then Neve's claim is natural and appropriate given her ignorance, but false. I mean, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can say something's possible and be wrong about that because you had no idea but like being ignorant is not like a crime especially when dealing with large numbers like that's fine no one's expecting you to like be able to multiply large numbers in your head however this quick dismissal overlooks important points we can suppose that neve knows every number is either necessarily prime or necessarily not prime so she knows that if 899 isn't prime, there are no possibilities in which it is prime, and Neve is not confident that the antecedent is false, that is, after all, what she says at 899 might be prime, and not that it is prime. So Neve should accept that she doesn't know whether there are any possibilities in which 899 is prime, either they all are or none are. It seems to follow that she cannot appropriately assert that there are some possibilities in which 899 is prime, but according to QA, this is what she asserts, asserted by saying 899 might be prime. I don't really, what? Like, what? There only has to be one possibility where 899 is prime to say that there are possibilities that there 899 is prime. So I don't really, this seems like a really weird point to say that because there aren't more than one, like, possibilities in which it's prime, it only needs to be one possibility in which it's prime. I don't really, I think I know where the author is going with this, but I don't like how they're getting there. Um, because they're just breaking into, well, it is prime or it isn't. And you're saying, well, it possibly is the one in which it is prime. That's all you're saying. Like, come on, author. That's like unfair to Neve. Like now, according to QA, what she cannot appropriately assert that there are some. Yeah, exactly. How many do you actually need for there to be some is the, I guess the question here. As long as all you have to do is say some only means at least one. And if you're saying some means that there has to be more than one that's actually an excessive uh, assumption of a theory to say that as long as you're saying there is somebody named Noger broadcasting right now then that this is it's true there only has to be one there only has to be somebody named Noger broadcasting on Twitch right now there doesn't have to be more than one and so putting this sort of like why can't you just say that there are that one possibility so all right but that's all right this is no big deal I think I know what they're trying to do. They're trying to force in this into the uh, dichotomy. Either all the um, possibilities are true or all the possibilities are false. So, in that case, she knows that it's, it, it has to be one or the other. And if you know it has to be one of the others, you wouldn't say it might be one of them. You're just restating the problem that you don't know. That's all. Okay. Note that we assume that throughout that necessarily... Ugh, Note that we assume throughout that necessarily coextensive propositions like the necessarily false propositions that 899 is prime and that 2 plus 2 is 5 can be non-identical and therefore that propositions are not simply sets of possible worlds. Proponents of the possible world analysis of propositions have strategies for accommodating the apparent different between believing that 899 is prime and believing 2 plus 2 is 5, some of which generate alternative solutions to the pro- current problem of, Q- of 4QA. This is actually what I was leading to what I was saying before. There's other ways of analyzing the problem. They're not talking about that. So this is nice that they mentioned it. You know, this seems also like 
maybe a reviewer was like, you have to say this. And so they threw this paragraph in right here. Um, which is, yeah, that's fine. <coughs> Standard responses. We shall now discuss the prop prospects for two common responses to this problem and why we find them unpromising in order to motivate retaining QA unmodified and offering a pragmatic solution. The less revisionary attempt proposes that modals quantify over not just metaphysical possibilities, but also so-called epistemic possibilities, including metaphysically impossible possibilities. All right, we're going to do some crazy stuff. Metaphysically impossible possibilities. Like, that's always a lot of fun. <laughs> the less... <laughs> so, yeah, feel free to ask questions about this stuff. I, I know this is getting... This is going to get a little bit funky if we're going to do metaphysically impossible possibilities. All right. That cannot be ruled out a priority. This move only slightly departs from the standard QA picture. Unfortunately, it does not solve the puzzle. Suppose Neve knows Peano's axioms as well as the definitions of number theoretic terms. It follows a priori from these that 899 is not prime. So this is what I was talking about. We're going to go into classical mathematics here. Classical set theory. So there are no epistemic possibilities consistent with what Neve knows, metaphysically possible or not, in which 890 is prime and her utterance of 899 might be prime is predicted to be false. Mm, yeah, you, well, okay, let's, I'm going to hold off criticizing because they're probably going to get to it. The more revisionary proposal rejects QA. It allows a proposition to be epistemically possible for a person even if its negation is a, an a priori consequence of her beliefs. More, most of the purveyors of our problem av avow this picture. A simple version says that it might be that P is true in a context just in case the speaker doesn't know that P is false. Yeah, so if you don't know it's not P, then it might be P. And all right, so these people talk about it. We won't refute this response, but uh, but observe that it seems to require abandoning a unified semantic treatment of modals, since our problem also arises for epistemic possibility modals such as may and could, and these terms also have deontic uses standardly analyzed over quantifying over deontic possibilities. This requires introducing into this class of terms something more like ambiguity than context sensitivity. We prefer to retain the unified QA semantics and search for a pragmatic solution. Okay, so this one basically says, um, you're, 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 you're specifying things to that specific context with that person saying right there, and you're having like some sort of like details which these people talk about, and the author is saying, we're not talking about it like this. We're, we're not trying to just say, okay, what that person meant at that one time in that one context is okay. We're trying to give a unified view. So this is fine. What I was going to say up here was, um, this kind of also assumes the uh, positive introspection, which means that everything you know, you also know all the consequences of it. So even though she knows Piano's axiom, axioms as well as the number of theoretic terms, that kind of implies that she also knows it follows a priori from these that 899 is prime. Yeah, but like just because you know the theory, the theorems, that don't mean you know all the consequences Oh, that like follow from them that would be crazy if we gave like someone you could learn the like laws of math and then you automatically were able to derive all the uh consequences of that i mean that's nuts so i i think this might be a little bit funky right here so i mean saying there's no epistemic possibilities consistent with neve knows yeah there's no epistemic possibilities but that also would imply that she had gone through all the epistemic possibilities in her head, which is not with a, you'd be rich with cryptocurrency? Exactly. Like, you'd be, it's not a uh, feasible thing to say that it, that once you knew the laws, you could figure out everything. So there still might be some epistemic way out, like in terms of how you are actually, uh, what, what the limits of your own knowledge are. So if like self-reflecting back on your ignorance, and that's what she's really referring to. When you say 899 might be, um, prime you might be saying look the limits of my knowledge are such that i don't know what the outcome is not you're not actually talking about 899 anymore you're talking about how you uh your extent to which you understand piano's axioms so but i mean that's clearly not what people usually mean but you could also go that way okay the pragmatic role of might statements 
Our solution retains QA without modification, claiming that the intuition that what Neve says is true is misleading. We explain why Neve's statement is natural and appropriate and why it might seem as if Neve says something true. This is because the most important and salient thing she is communicating is both relevant and true. In this section, we motivate a general account of the most important thing communicated by typical utter utterances of epistemic might sentences. This is a very strong claim, actually, that they're going to... um general account of the most important thing communicated by typical utterances of epistemic might senses. Now, I'm sure you guys have all read all the literature on epistemic might, but like for anyone else out there, um, like saying you might go to the store, someone might be sick, like these are all like things that might have to do with your, these are things that have to do with your knowledge. And so there's a huge class of statements so that they're going to tell you the most important thing about them is that's a big, uh, big undertaking. Okay. Grace's 1989 work on conversational pragmatics emphasizes that the content content at a context of the sentence a, a speaker utters, roughly what is said, often isn't the only or most important thing she communicates. Speakers often use sentences that mean one thing to convey in addition or instead something that better fit the conversational purpose. We suggest this is generally true of uses of epistemic might senses. In addition, or sometimes instead of asserting a sentence's semantic content, content, a speaker communicates information about what she takes to be a serious option in reasoning. Speakers may communicate other things too, such as the recommendation that the audience ought to take the relevant possibilities as serious options in reasoning, but for simplicity, we will focus on just this implicature. Okay, so this is... um. I read a paper, it was called, uh, what was it? Is to say what is the most salient things. So when, you know, when someone says just saying, like they bring something up that is kind of like, well, what's the point? They're saying just saying. Like, hey, look at this pencil. Look at it. Like as if it meant something. So when you bring something up, it's like, well, you just said, okay, look at the pencil. That doesn't mean anything in itself. But like usually there is a serious option and reasoning. And so like, should I bring um, an umbrella tomorrow? It's like, do I bring an umbrella? Well, what's the serious options? And you can, you'd say something like, well, the weatherman said this. And that's why are you saying what the weatherman said, even if it isn't exactly what the, um, why are you saying what the weatherman said, even if it isn't the exact forecast? Because it, it shows what you think is the most important thing that was said. And that's why you say, well, the, might you take the umbrella? If I say that to you, like, might you take the umbrella? It means that is the most important thing to do right now to, is to take your umbrella. So you, it's a sort of a weakening of the, uh, like, you're not ordering someone to take the umbrella. You're telling them that that's the most important option among all the options. If I say, you might want to take your umbrella right now. Or like, if your parents say, you might want to watch your language then you know that you're going to be in trouble if you keep speaking up. <coughs> okay. First, we'll show that might claims ordinarily communicate something like this. Second, we'll show that this, how what is communicated is calculable as a conversational implicature given QA. Okay. Suppose that investigating a murder... In investigating a murder, Holmes and Watson are reviewing their evidence, which is compatible with any any of thousands of people being the murderer. Holmes says Moriarty might be the murderer. He communicates more than simply that it is consistent with their evidence that Moriarty is the murderer. He seems to suggest that he considers Moriarty a serious suspect. We claim that typically from a sentence of the form, it might be that P is used to convey that the speaker takes the content of the prejacent P as a serious option of reasoning. Okay, see these peoples. When an agent explicitly reasons in a situation of uncertainty, she generally doesn't consider all the options consistent with her evidence. This is often too complex and cognitively demanding. Rather, she focuses on some options, which she will reflect on, which she will reflect on and gather evidence about. Yeah. So, as opposed to me saying you might want to take your umbrella, Holmes is saying Moriarty might be the murderer because out of all the possibilities, that's the most important one, and you're still saying it's a possibility, you don't know it, but that's the one we should be focusing on. I might be rich with cryptocurrency. I really wish I had crypt like tons of cryptocurrency right now. Last I checked, it was at th Bitcoin was at $32,000. Oh my god. So yeah. 
QA can explain this feature. Yeah, and guys, feel free to ask questions if you want. QA can explain this feature of epistemic discourse by appeal to Grice's first maximum of quantity. Make your contribution as informative as is required. The semantic content of Holmes' claim is extremely weak. For each of us, use a huge number of people. There is a possibility consistent with Holmes' evidence in which that person is the murderer. So why would Holmes mention Moriarty specifically instead of his childhood doctor, or Watson's mother, or the Queen of England? This weakness is an issue for many non-QA theories of epistemic models, including theories of, of those who use our problem as an objection to QA. Yeah, it was a very nice Firestorm raid. It was big hype. <laughs> Thanks again, Firestorm. Uh, yeah. Holmes' assertion communicates more than that nobody in the community has taken oh, has a way of knowing that Moriarty isn't the murderer. That Holmes isn't justified in dismissing Moriarty as the murderer or that uh, all these different ways these people are splitting this or that it is possible simpliciter that Moriarty is the murderer. These theories, therefore, are obliged to accept pragmatic supplementation similar to what we proposed below, which Braun at least avows. Yeah, so... You're, when you say something like, might you take your umbrella, of course you might take your umbrella, you might or you might not. Moriarty might or, Moriarty might or might not be the murderer, but it's only brought up because it's an important, it's the most important out of all the options. And that's why you're wasting your breath on it. Since Holmes and Watson are trying to identify a list of suspects to investigate further, the natural conjecture for Watson is that Holmes asserts that it is compatible with their evidence that Moriarty is a murderer with the intention of making him salient as a suspect. Here's where I've seen this before as salience of options. We can show this by considering what is, according to QA, an equivalent utterance. Suppose Holmes instead says it is consistent with our evidence that Moriarty is the murderer. Watson replies, do you really think we should be investigating him? Holmes responds, no, of course not. We don't know any motive Moriarty would have, and we don't have a reason to suspect he was even at the scene. Watson would be puzzled about why Holmes mentioned Moriarty at all. At all. That is, that our positive implicature arises when using an explicit QA paraphrase suggests that it is that it arises given this analysis of might. Yeah, so the might is used as a way of highlighting the possibility, sort of like saying it's very important. Given QA and the ordinary purpose of asserting might sentences, the speaker will normally implicate that she takes the prejacent proposition as a serious option in reasoning. So we posit the existence of a generalized conversational implicature with, it, with this content. The use of might is enough by itself, but defeasibly to convey this content. But this pragmatic account is also subtle enough to explain why this implicature is defeasible or cancelable. For example, when responding to Holmes' utterance of Moriarty might be the murderer, Inspector Lestrade can felicitously say, yes, Moriarty might be the murderer, so might your childhood doctor or Watson's mother or the Queen of England. Don't waste our time until you have something concrete to go on. Here, he makes bare assertion of the consistency with the evidence without communicating, indeed while denying that these are serious options. He cancels the normal implicature by mentioning alternatives that transparently are not serious options. Yeah. So, that's all fine. This defeasibility or cancelability of what is pragmatically conveyed constitutes a significant ad advantage for our proposal over semantic accounts that attribute expressive or recommend recommendatory content to the meaning of might because these are because there are cases where no expression or recommendation of taking the prejason as a serious option in reasoning is plausible though the QA semantics fit well this includes using uses of might under quantifiers anybody might be the murderer in the past tense Moriarty might have been the murderer for all we know although we don't know he wasn't and for possibilities outside of our cognitive grasp there are people we don't know about who might be the murderer because our story appeals to the conversational purpose of the utterance, it allows for varying implicatures given varying conversational purposes, such as expressing one's refusal to dismiss something as a serious option in reasoning, expressing that something should have been taken as a serious option, etc. Okay, so basically they're saying the reason you use might is to imply what you think is most important, not actually what um, might means in other contexts as selecting as showing possibilities but as highlighting the most 
salient of the possibilities as the one you should talk about. And then you can cancel it by redistributing the um, value to the other possibilities again. So like if you say you might take your umbrella and I say, well, I might or I might not. By redistributing the salience, you've been using it all along. Um, gnarly, just so you know, this is... um. I wouldn't, this is one use of might. I wouldn't call this the most important use of might. This is, although the, the, these people are saying, like they said up here, actually it's way up there, that um, this is like the most important thing. This is not the most important use of might, or it's w one of the important uses of might. I wouldn't put too much stock into this. This is a nice explanation of a uh, linguistic phenomenon. And I've seen it, I've seen this before. And so it's like, this is just a different account of it. So um, it's nice, but I wouldn't, nothing to uh, go crazy about. <laughs> I mean, it's just a very, I think this is just a nice paper explaining uh, this, uh, what it, one use of the word might. Like if I say you might take your umbrella, you know that it's a good idea to take your umbrella. But there are other ways to say might in a sense. Application to our case. <coughs> yeah, and feel, guys, feel free to people out there ask me questions. Although the semantic content of a might sense involving an unobvious impossibility, like 899 might be prime, is according to QA necessarily false. The pragmatic aspect of might discourse sketched above is no less applicable than in the Holmes case. An agent may reasonably take a proposition as a serious option in reasoning, in reasoning which isn't actually consistent with what she knows. This can happen when the inconsistency is unobvious, as with the primality of 899. Well, well this the inconsistency is unobvious. Well, wasn't that the whole problem above when they were saying if she knew the piano axioms, wouldn't that make it obvious? See, well, that seems a little weird to me right here. Why is this um, inconsistency on obvious okay down here, but it was not above when we were talking about, well, if you know all the piano axioms and classical math, then you obviously it follows that 899 is not prime. Okay, continuing. Maybe they answer. Maybe I'm wrong about this. But if you left your umbrella laying around and you said the same thing, um, yeah, well... Maybe I'm just telling you to pick it, the damn thing up and put it back where you uh, it was supposed to go, as opposed to like laying it lying around. It might not it might not be raining. So in that case, like I said, you might want to like move your umbrella. That might be. That's like among all the other options, it's saying well, put that umbrella away. It's not saying like it's not actually choosing among options. It's a directive to say you better fucking move your umbrella. <laughs> That's more when, like, your mom is criticizing that you might want to watch your mouth. It's not actually saying that there's options. It's saying that you better not uh, say anything bad anymore. So, yeah. Okay, so... In Neve's context, where the question primal has been raised explicitly and the conversationals are unaware that 899 isn't prime, she takes it as a serious option that 899 is prime. Well, I mean, that's... That, that's a very reasonable thing of what she's saying. She says, well, we don't know. It might be prime. It, it, in that case, though, she's just restating the problem. And so she's just saying, well, you're asking of 899 prime. And she says, oh, it might be prime. That's just saying that's not actually doing anything in the conversational implicature. She's just restating the problem at that point. So I'm not sure that this is the right analysis because in that context, that was the question under consideration. And if that's the question under consideration, she's not making it salient anymore. Okay. We can therefore expect, uh, continuing, we can therefore expect that when Neve says 899 might be prime, she implicates that she takes it as a serious option in reasoning that 899 is prime. This seems to, seems the right thing to communicate in her, her situation. See, I'm not 100% sure this is the thing, but I mean, it's close at least. So QA explains why Neve has a reason to utter that sentence. However, providing a reason isn't equivalent to providing a justification. To justify Neve's utterance or explain why it seems natural and appropriate, we need to also to show that she didn't obviously have a stronger reason to say something else here instead. Supposing QA is true, the key difference with the Holmes case is that the proposition Neve asserts is false. Well, 
we don't know if Moriarty killed the person. Um, so maybe that, maybe Moriarty had nothing to do with it. Maybe that is also false. I don't know. I mean, we we do know that what Neve asserts is false, but the we maybe it's still up in the air for Holmes. I don't know, but I mean, it may actually just be in the in the course of that story false. It's possible. There are stories where Holmes has gotten things wrong before. This might seem a decisive reason not to express herself in that way. Why doesn't Neve directly ass- assert that she takes it to be a serious option in reasoning that 899's prime avoiding the risk of falsehood? If we want to respect the intuition that Neve's utterance was natural and appropriate, this may prompt us to reject QA. However, the account we've sketched can explain the naturalness of Neve's utterance. It is common to say something literally false to communicate something important and true. For example, 1. You're a real genius. Sarcasm? And I could eat a horse, hyperbole. Admittedly, these aren't the best models for understanding Neve's utterance. They exploit the transparent falsity of the content of the sentence, whether we assert or just, as Grice would say, make as if to say this content, in order to pragmatically convey something relevant and true. However, there are other situations where the content of the sentence which is asserted is false, and what is implied is true, where we only recognize the falsity of what is said on reflection. So, yeah. You're a real genius. That's obviously false, because I guess maybe it is when you say it, depending who you say it to. But, I mean, all right, let's continue. I'm not exactly sure what's going on yet. Suppose that while driving, you ask for, or while driving, you ask for water. Seeing only a few drops in the bottle, I say, there's none left. This is literally false, but what I convey that there's not enough water, to, water left to have anything substantial to drink is true. One might grant the example, but still wonder why it makes sense to say this false thing to convey something true. One reason is that uttering the shorter sentence is more convenient, knowing that your audience will recognize the obvious implicature. Other examples, okay, so they're basically saying it's just more convenient to say the false thing that was the, like, 100, it's like, it's closer to the way it is. Yeah, well, it's not laziness, it's convenience. I mean, it's, you, you, like, it's reasonable to say, look, there's nothing to drink, if, even if there's only one drop to drink, because that's not what the person wanted. They didn't want the drop. So it's uh, being more efficient a lot of times. Other examples include we're out of gas and I have nothing to do all weekend. A case, in, a case even more like Neves where we aren't in a position to know whether the content's truth. Minutes from your destination, your partner worries that the spare tire is flat and suggests you stop and check. You reply, the spare isn't flat without knowing so. Suppose the spare is flat. You've spoken appropriately and usefully, communicating that you shouldn't stop to check, despite saying something you couldn't know that it was, in fact, false. Yeah, so you're trying to use a shortcut here is what basically it is. A similar explanation helps us understand why Neves asserts something she doesn't know is true in order to convey something relevant and true. Part of the answer lies in the convenience or efficiency... Hey, is what I'm saying. I always like when I get something right. Convenience or efficiency of the sentence 899 might be prime. More importantly, according to our proposal, this implicature is by default read into might statements, making it the first kind of communicative device that comes to mind when looking to express such a state of mind. So they're saying using the might statement here, even though it is inappropriate in terms of the like semantics, is the most convenient and efficient way to get the point across. Okay. I mean, I'll, you know, and the truth is I'm not, I'm starting not to buy their story here, but like, that's all right. I think they did it well and they're like good philosophers. It's just, I, I happen to disagree and that's fine. Readers may have a further reservation that there is a sense that Neve doesn't merely speak felicitously, but also asserts something true and nothing false. In response, we propose that a further factor is semantic opacity. It is possible that ordinary competent users and interpreters of English, like Neve and ourselves, typically fail to recognize that such assertions are literally false. So we're just idiots now? See, this is what I was getting at. I don't like this because... Yeah. We always say things that are false. Yeah, but that's on a very, very, very strict version of language, I think. We're not, we don't all speak so formally. So I think to call things literally false is a little bit misleading. Anywho, continuing. Distinguishing between the semantic content of a sentence and its typical pragmatic accompaniments is often difficult. 
This is especially true of generalized implicatures as we have suggested for might sentences and the expression of taking options seriously. This is unsurprising given widespread theoretical disagreements in philosophy and linguistics among competent speakers about correct semantic analysis of words. This is what I'm saying. The widespread problems here, no one actually agrees on this, and so the fact that we're taking these things as literally false is already assuming certain interpretations of how we speak. And so I find that a little... uh. Yeah. Grew. Yeah. Well, exactly. You could have your words mean one thing at a certain time and then later mean something different. And then you've got <laughs> grew troubles in philosophy of language. Yeah. Could be done. Okay. We're almost at the end anyway. Therefore, even if QA is correct, competent speakers may not generally be aware of this. You see, this is what I don't like. This is making us sound like we don't know what we're talking about. I mean, we may not know all the details of what we're talking about, but it's like, eh, who, who's actually, whose semantics is this? Is it what we, what we are normally communicating and everyone gets along communicating? Or is it some theoretical abstract construct and then everyone's wrong except for the people who, speak, who really understand this, the abstract semantics? I'm not sure I'm with the philosophers of language on this one. I might be just with the everyday speakers. Okay, continuing. Without explicit knowledge of the correct semantic theory, recognizing that the utterance appropriately conveys what such, what such utterances Stanley convey, as we've argued is the case with Neve's utterance, makes it natural to assume it's true. See? <laughs> yeah, without explicit knowledge of the semantic theory. The, this hypothesis is bolstered by noting that cases like Neve's are unusual. Yeah, that's true. Very rarely are you talking about prime numbers. Generally, when it is reasonable to take something as a serious option in reasoning, that proposition is consistent with one's evidence. Cases where something is reasonably taken as a serious option because of the unobviousness of its consistency with one's evidence are comparatively rare in ordinary life. Perhaps accepting, and perhaps accepting involves accepting examples involving Kripke's necessary a posteriori. Like today might be Wednesday, she might be Maria, water might be H2O. This explains why speakers often fail to notice their problematic nature. Okay, so, unobvious inconsistency. I don't know about this. Very little of what we say is 100% true all the time. Like, we never say things that are like, unless you're saying something like, logical truths those are the only like perfectly consistent statements that don't have any like floaty like baggage attached to anything else if you're just saying like really abstract philosophical statements then yeah but like everything else is so messy in this world and so i'm not so like why is it like the unobviousness of inconsistency is that's not an obvious thing at all one thing what that is so yeah i'm starting to get grumpy now okay continuing yeah, I'm like almost done. I don't want to be grumpy. One could complain that our attributing error or confusion to ordinary speakers is a heavy cost. This is what I'm saying right here. This is weird. I don't like it. Does this favor a theory that denies Neve's assertion and many people's intuitions about it are false? We don't think so since the opacity hypothesis has countervailing benefits. Maybe they want to make you grumpy. No, I'm a grumpy person when it comes to philosophy. This is why I do a lot of philosophy. I'm just like, what are they talking about? I have other opinions and it's like... I'm just grumpy to begin with. Um, philosophers are curmudgeons. For example, if someone pressed Neve about this problem, for example, that 899, if 899 isn't prime, then it necessarily isn't prime, it seems natural for Neve to become puzzled and on reflection retract her claim, okay, I don't know whether 899 might be prime. I just know that I'm not in a position to say whether it is prime. You see, but isn't this a weird thing for her to say? She was like, no, this is restating the problem. That's exactly what... You wouldn't retract it. You'd just clarify the, the problem. But you still could express the problem by saying 899 might, might prime. It is prime or it isn't prime. So there are, those are the options that I'm ranging over. Our account makes sense of this re reaction, unlike theories that reject QA. Yeah, but see, I reject this reaction. <laughs> So yeah, you can make sense of this reaction, unlike theories that reject QA, many of which are hard-pressed to explain why Neve shouldn't stick to our guns. This is also a reason to prefer our account to an error theory assigning ordinary speakers' mistaken beliefs and metaphysical possibilities in which actual primes are in prime. Yeah, so this is the uh, this is the metaphysically biting the bullet, where you could say actual primes are in prime, you're just denying what primes are. 
which of course you can do, but that's really biting a hard metaphysical bullet. Plausibly, a semantic theory should give a greater weight to what people say after careful consideration than to their immediate unconsidered responses. See, why? Why, why, why? What counts as careful consideration? Like, who's careful consideration? Once you force them into a metaphysical corner, then you get to say, well, okay, now what they say is better? Not necessarily. I'm with the everyday person because most of the time what everyday people is reasonable. And so, like, that's well, not reasonable. It makes sense what people are saying. What it, it It's when you get to the, like, abstract philosophy, that's the problem. So why would you take what, what they say when they're backed into a corner as the uh, epitome of, like, making sense? It isn't always. Now, after careful consideration and you still don't agree with what they said to begin with, then you have to figure out why that went wrong. I don't know if, uh, like, I think what... Neve said to begin with makes perfect sense before and still makes sense now and I think we've got a disconnect on what each of us me versus the authors here are taking as the more important evidence so there's a difference in like what exactly is the uh, target of the evidence in philosophy of language here okay concluding we have argued that the unified and powerful QA account of modal terms shouldn't be rejected because of the felicity of might senses about unobvious impossibilities. This problem is amenable to our straightforward pragmatic explanation given the purposes for which might sentences are standardly used in conversation on the basis of their QA semantics. Their uses can be pragmatically felicitous even if their semantic content contents are literally false. And there is a re there is a ready explanation why this falsity is easily missed. Okay, cool. This is a good paper. Um, laying my cards on the table, you can see I don't agree with these authors. Like, I do not usually appeal to Gricean theories. Those are not the sort of theories I like. And so, I don't appeal to context. I don't appeal to um, pragmatics of this sort. And so, like, that's why I'm grumpy at the moment. Because these guys are in a slightly different tradition and... This happens. This is a nice paper. It's well written, I thought. Um, there wasn't too much jargon, which is always a danger when you're talking about philosophy of language and sort of epistemic modals and all this stuff. But they have a nice example. I think where it comes out, um, like, I agree. You can say 899 might be prime is a convenient sentence, but not because of what they were saying. I say, because I think it expresses that we are discussing this is what is under discussion right now, and we're highlighting the possibility, that's a good sentence. It just means that we are highlighting that possibility among the others out of all the other things we might be discussing here. There is nothing that we have to uh, explain further than that, and that's what these people have to explain. They're trying to say there's more going on. I don't think there's more going on. You're just highlighting what we're talking about right now. Okay, so where was I going to say? Okay, here's where I think we have a problem here. You, it's common to say something literally false to communicate something important and true. For example, you're a real genius. You're being so when you're being sarcastic, you're saying something that's obviously wrong to get like to show that the opposite is the case. Mhm. Mm so yeah, it's like so why are we calling these things false statements to begin with? Because they're obviously false. It's like yeah, but what Neve's saying is not obviously false. She's describing the situation. And she's not actually describing it in a known sarcastic way or hyperbole, a hyperbolistic way. Because what's happening here in these examples, and this is kind of where I think the uh, authors got wrong, these people know what they're saying. You, you know you're being sarcastic. You know you can't eat a horse. Neve, of course, does not. The question under discussion is what is a prime? What is 899 prime? And so I don't. I, I think there's a serious uh, disconnect between some of the examples here that um, they're giving and what is happening. Um, Gnarly asks, looking for a solution, 899 or, or any number might be prime or excluding a possibility. 899 prime. Yes, that's kind of what I'm saying. You are, that, This is a good way to put it. Looking. That's what, what's going on here. We are looking for something. We're looking for a solution. And um, I think that's kind of what's uh, being missed a little bit. Um along the way in some of these uh, examples. So, yeah, I just want to, for, just to show you guys that I know what I'm talking about, 
the stream has now been going almost exactly one hour longer from when uh, I started looking for these. And this was a 15 page paper double spaced. So if I was going to do a 30 page paper, not double spaced or double spaced or the 20 page paper that was not double spaced, it literally would take at least 45 minutes to another hour and I'd be dead because this is not as easy. Uh, it's not easy to read and review. So I've done it before, but I mean, I really get exhausted. Okay. But it, on the whole, I agree with their analysis here that when people say, hey, you might want to check this out, you might like, you might want to watch your mouth, it's highlighting the most salient possibility among a range of possibilities, and uh, that's a good example, and you can stick to their guns, and the way they're sticking to the guns here is by appealing to the pragmatics of uh, language to add more information in that the standard theory needed. So it retains QA without modification, and then they're adding stuff on top of it to do with the uh, conversational context. So, see me, I modify the logic and the semantics. They are keeping the, the classic semantics and then adding um, context on top of it. This is just a sort of a methodological difference between how each of us looks at this problem. That'd be me versus the authors. Okay, but yeah, if you guys have any other questions, um, I think that's it for now. Uh, this was a good paper. Um, the other stuff we read earlier I thought was fun too. So yeah, keep the uh, suggestions coming. I'm actually, for anyone that cares, I'm going to actually end up, set up setting up a Discord, mainly for the other uh, for my Minesweeper streams because I'm working on my Minesweeper game and people have asked for a Discord so that we can discuss. Yeah, thank you, Firestorm, again, and I'm happy, uh, Eric, 556, 5556. Um, yeah, um, Firestorm, like, because uh, I'm in the Mines, I play Minesweeper also, and so some of uh, the fire, the Minesweeper people also play uh, Tetris, and so that's kind of like, yeah. So it's, uh, everyone's, like, real nice. So I appreciate Firestorm, and thanks, I'm um, happy you're happy. So, yeah, that's what I do, I play Minesweeper and I read Philosophy. So, but yeah, I'm going to start a discord mainly because I'm uh, working on my uh, custom uh, Minesweeper mod and people want to discuss it. So this get the community uh, feedback. So I'll also, you can also ask me about the uh, philosophy stuff there too. Okay. So thanks everyone for being here and uh, have a great night and uh, I'll be back probably in a few days. So. Be safe, everyone, and have a great night. Happy New Year, by the way.